Madden here to a presentation from Kurt Madden, Superintendent of the Big Bear, uh, the Bear Valley Unified School District, with an update on fiscal operations and capital projects. Hey, you're not Kurt. You Madden. don't look like Kurt Madden. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm older than he is, and I can't run as much as he. Is. <laughs> No, this is a joint presentation. I'm going to start out and do the easier part, and Kurt will get into the uh, more challenging part. Um, Mayor, council members, staff, nice to see you all. There are a couple of you I haven't seen in very long, uh, in a very long time. We're going to cover tonight what's called the local control funding formula and the local control accountability plan, referred to as the LCFF and the LCAP. And I'm going to go over the LCFF, and then I'll turn it over to Kurt to go over the LCAP. So um, in addition to covering those items, we're going to talk about what does this mean for Bear Valley Unified, and we'll summarize and, of course, questions. We'll answer any questions you may have. So the local control funding formula, this is Governor Brown's brainchild, and it was designed to close the achievement gap. And his basic uh, premise behind this is social justice. And those are his words. Those are not my words. Social justice meaning that we should serve the underserved or the underprivileged students. And what it's designed to do is it's designed to increase transparency and reduce complexity, reduce the administrative burden. Now, as, as Kurt and I just uh, presented our first interim report to our board, we had some of these similar items in here. And I don't know where the reduced complexity is and the uh, reduction in the administrative burden because it's going to be a lot required by our district to do this doesn't mean it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's going to generate some opportunities for kids that didn't exist before. But it's a lot of work, especially in the startup year for us. It improves funding equity across school districts. And that's really driven by the demographics of, uh, of school districts. And basically, those school districts that have higher free and reduced lunch programs, foster students, as well as English learners, will get more money. It's that simple. It improves local accountability, and I'm not going to touch too much on that because that's what the LCAP is all about, and I'll leave those comments for Kurt. The LCFF is a new model. It's very complicated. It's a very complicated computation from the old funding model we had for the past 40 years. And I gave it a little prelude to this just a moment ago, but it starts with a grade level grant. So K through three would receive a certain amount per student, four through six, another amount, seven through eight, another amount, and then nine through 12. And then on top of that grade level grant, you would have these supplemental and concentration grants. So you get additional amount for free and reduced students, English learners, foster use. There's also a class size reduction component to it that requires us to get to a 24 to one class size in K through three by the year 2021, and there's some additional funds for that as well. And then career technical education, which ties into our current ROP program. So I already mentioned that this is an eight-year target. So what happens is we go through this computation today and we project out what our eight-year target is going to be. And then based on the funding from the state, supposedly we'll achieve that target. And as you can see on your, your uh, printout there, your PowerPoint, this, the premise of this assumes that the funding to K-12 education will grow by 17 million between now and 2021. What it doesn't consider are any, any economic or political fluctuations or the Prop 30 temporary taxes. I wanna take those three items and break them down. If we look at economic fluctuations, we all know what we've just been through the last several years. Quite an economic fluctuation. Sounds like a political term. Makes it sound not as bad as it really was. I want to add to that, if you went back to the, to the crash in 1929, on average, from then to now, every 4.6 years, our country goes through a recession. I want to tie this back to the assumption that's made on the LCFF, that the, the state revenues will grow consistently over the next eight years. So having said that, is there anybody in this room that believes that the economy is going to continue to grow like this over the next eight years in our state? Probably not. We're all optimists here, Mr. Cohn. 
<laughs> I'm just asking the question, Mayor. <laughs> The Department of Finance has already come out and said it's not going to happen in eight years, more likely nine or ten. But that's one of the premises of the LCFF. It assumes this ongoing, consistent growth. It doesn't consider any political changes. I think everybody in this room is well aware that California is dominated by democratic rule. I'm not making a value judgment about that. I'm making a statement. The Republicans were not necessarily on board with the LCFF. So if there's a change in control in our state, it leaves a lot of uncertainty for the LCFF, in addition to the economics we just talked about. On the Prop 30 temporary taxes, that uh, brought to our state about $7 billion. The sales tax part of that expires in 2016. It goes away. The income tax part of that, the increased income tax, expires in 2019. To our knowledge, our state legislature has not made any provisions for this funding dip. Hasn't been considered. So I already mentioned there, I'm actually getting my, my presentations confused. I mentioned that previously in my other presentation. I didn't mention this yet. Based on our demographics, where's Bear Valley? We're at about a 72% what we call an unduplicated count. And an unduplicated count would be this. On those uh, supplemental grants we talked about for free and reduced students, foster students, and English learners, an unduplicated count, if you had a ninth grader that was a free and reduced student that didn't speak English and was a foster student, you wouldn't get three counts for that. You would only get one. So as we add up those three categories in our district, we're about 72% of our students fall into one of those categories. That's considered a medium percentile eligible school district. High would be considered 90. And that's going to drive a lot of the extra funding that we're going to get. Now, when you think about this and you look at other districts that would be in, let's just say, Beverly Hills, for example, I don't know what their stats are, but my guess is they don't have a lot of free or reduced students. They probably don't have a lot of English language learners, and they probably don't have a lot of foster kids. So on a per student basis, we in Bear Valley will get more than a, a Beverly Hills type of school district. And then the other thing to know about this, because the public believes you got Prop 30, you got LCFF, you should have all this money rolling into the school districts. Is the funding mechanism or how much is allocated to K-12 education in our state is still the same as it always has been? And that's Prop 98. And essentially what Prop 98 says is as revenues in the state goes up, go up, we get more, more money, K-12 education. If they're stable, we get the same amount. And if they go down, state revenues go down, we get reduced. We just experienced that over the last several years. We lost about $4 million in revenue on a $24 million budget. Any questions on those items? Mr. Young? Um, Mr. Kahn, you had mentioned that the uh, the way that you normally funded or the funding for schools is about 40 years old under the old program. Does this, bottom line, does this solve your problems? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't solve our problems. We're going to get more money this year. We're likely going to get more money next year and in the, in the forthcoming years. Kurt's going to talk a little bit about the LCAP. And there's going to be some obligations, some fiscal obligations associated with that LCAP. We are definitely in better financial shape today as we were a year ago, partly because of this. So this is a component of solving our problems. This puts us in a better position. It's still going to take good fiscal management. Sure. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Coretto. Mr. Coretto. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you said that the um, LCAP LCFF um, assumes the um, amount will grow by $17 billion. Does that also assume that the Prop 30 temporary taxes will somehow magically be extended and so that revenue will continue also? Or is it $17 billion less the Prop 30 temporary taxes? To my knowledge, there have been no provisions made for the, when those temporary taxes go away. I believe that the assumption is 
regardless of those the prop thirty taxes prop ninety eight will grow at the rate of seventeen million over the next eight years seventeen billion oh, yeah. in the next eight years okay um, I guess one of the other things that that kind of bugs me is all of the special cases that you talked about where you get extra money there's no mention of gate kids or any kids that excel in our district and there are a lot of them and uh, is there any provision for additional funding for the excellent students that we have there is no additional funding funding for the excellent students we have having said that we used to receive a lot of money unrestricted and then another portion of the money restricted Pre-2008-9 state budget, we actually got some money for what was called GATE, which is what you're referring to. And we would receive for our, at the time, about 2,900 students, a whopping $22,000 for the GATE program. Mm -hmm. Proportionately, there was not a whole lot of money. That GATE, that 22000 has been rolled up a lot of those restricted programs have been rolled up into the LCFF formula. It doesn't come to us in a little package that says this is your gate money right. and you can only spend it on gate as it did before, but it's considered to be in that, in that LCFF. There's a lot of programs like that. There's uh, music and arts. Uh, deferred maintenance is one, for example. We used to get that on a restricted basis. There was never really any discussions as to how we were going to spend that money. It had to go into deferred maintenance. That is now rolled up into the LCFF as unrestricted funds. So as we put together our LCAP, we're going to have to talk about how do we fund deferred maintenance at our sites. So the LCAP is really going to be the new strategic plan, and I'm, I'm stepping on my boss's shoes here. I better be careful. Uh, it's really going to be the new strategic plan as we move forward. Just, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just, just one totally unrelated thing re regarding deferred maintenance. I appreciate your, yours and Kurt's efforts to get the property on Jeffries cleaned up. It looks much better. So thank you. I wanted to add something about that eight-year funding model. And we just went over this tonight with our board. If we take our target, our eight-year target right now, that eight-year target is about $24.5 million dollars that we're targeted to receive in 2021. In 2008, we received $23.5 million. And that's accounting for the differential in attendance, in, in enrollment. So we're going to get back to the 2008 funding level, 13 years from 2008 and 2021. We'll probably still be 49th in the state in funding education. All right, taking these in order, Councilman Herrick. Hey, Walter. Um, it, well, it, as I'm listening to the conversation, it sounds like things are not as good as, as the presentation initially started out. Am I hearing that correct? It sounded rosy at first and then maybe not so rosy. So that's correct. I, I, that's, that's my view. Okay. The, uh, and this is just a philosophical point I want to bring up is it that uh, the, the folks who lived through the uh, Great Depression you know my parents probably your parents it affected them pretty deeply all the way to the point when they had money again they still would save whenever they possibly could it was just part of the Great Depression well we've gone through the Great Recession hopefully we've learned from that um, and it looked like at first when you're doing the presentation like things are going to be better and so forth and uh, the words of wisdom I was going to throw out there is is uh, just remember the Great Recession and, and be as conservative as possible as you're going along in your funding. Maybe it's not that way. I mean, you're smiling at me, so it's probably not as rosy as maybe, uh, again, the initial presentation started. But just, just remember the Great Recession. And when, when things get better, to always uh, be as conservative fiscally as you possibly can because, you know, we tripped into that Great Recession, and there could be another one around the corner. And, and that's my only words of advice I can I can give you at this point. Well, point well taken. And one of the takeaways um, that uh, Kurt and I wanted our board to have tonight in our presentation is this LCFF funding model, the word I use is, it's a very fragile model. Mm. And we have to move very slowly with it. Okay. Councilman Young? Yep. Um, Walter, I'm just curious on the, on the um, 
Under the model, the, there's an assumption that, that uh, K-12 education will grow by $17 billion. We all know there's going to be a couple of recessions in between now and then, but has the state, has Sacramento identified a plan B if they don't hit that goal? And where is the $17 billion going to come from if the taxes aren't extended? I'm smiling because you said, has Sacramento, do they have a plan B? Um, they don't have a specific plan B. What we have seen over the last few years, their plan B is to cut Prop 98. And they, they defer the payment of Prop 98. That's what's been their plan B that's worked effectively for the state. Um, they have no contingency plan that I know of um, for this. Perfect. Hmm? All right. Other questions of Mr. Kahn? Thank you very much, Walter. All right. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Mr. Mann. Good evening, City Council members, support staff, Mayor Obernolte, Jeff, and uh, community members. Walter, he kind of gave the yang, and I guess I'm going to get the yang. <clears throat> they they kind of go hand in hand, so we have to do both. I want to see that on a business card if you're going to do it that way. <laughs> You know, when we look at the first part, the eight major components, I think there's a couple things we need to keep in mind that in this community throughout the state, throughout the nation, we need to be proactive. And the reason why is when you look at the funding in California that we receive to educate a child, it's about $7,200 a year. At the same time, when a young person, for whatever reason, is incarcerated, it's costing our state $179,000. Start to multiply that out. Start to look at people that have encountered that third strike who are incarcerated right now. What are the odds of their children getting incarcerated? That's a scary thought. So I think when we look at our accountability plan, we really need to tell our stories. The good news is we are receiving more money because of our demographics. But any time you receive money, typically there's instructions. So this is really the accountability plan is the, is, is the, the side where we have to go ahead and tell our story. When you look at the uh, eight major components, again, basic services, proportionality. We need to make sure that our teachers are properly credentialed, that we have uh, instructional supplies and our facilities are in good shape. The course access, that's going to be real key, especially for our disadvantaged youth. We want to make sure that's happening. The implementation of the Common Core, and what that simply means is that we are getting our students career and college ready. There are, are no issues now of us waiting. We have to go ahead and show implementation. Uh, other student outcomes, again, with our school, student, uh, school accountability report card, we have to show that there's any issues in that with facilities or anything that we're um, actually showing that we're providing some, some increased services. Next is our parental involvement. We know that's going to be a real key. School climate, what about our suspension rates? What about our expulsion rates? Uh, student achievement, we can look at how many students are taking advanced placement classes, how many students are completing the UC requirements for A through G. Student engagement, we have to look at our attendance rates and again our dropout rates and our graduation rates. So those are the big eight right there. As we move on to the LCAP, um, we look at our timeline. The templates, we hope we're going to be ready by March from our State Board of Education. We're going to be proactive and we're not going to wait for the templates. We're going to start to go ahead and develop our plan. It's very ambitious that when we look from January 2014 to March, that's going to be the real time that we have to align the money that we're hopefully going to receive with our LCAP right here. So again, it's a new strategic plan. Um, this has to be really adopted by June 30th by our Board of Education. So when Walter finishes that budget development, our LCAP has to go hand in hand. Uh, when you start to look at our annual goals, um, these are things that we'll need to do. And again, these are based on state priorities and again, significant subgroups. That means students, we have to have at least 30 students in these um, subgroups and that should not be a problem for us. When we start to look at the expenditures, it's not only listing, it is describing how we're going to actually um, spend this money. 
Walter's talked about the unduplicated students, so we know we can't double or triple um, dip right there. And then lastly, uh, the specific actions. Again, what steps um, are the district going to go ahead and uh, do to accomplish the annual goals? And also from the sites. So the task now is to have each principal go ahead and start to think about their school, think about the demographics, think about their site plan, and how we're going to take their site plan and roll it into a district plan. When we start to look at the requirements of the OCAP, and again, as I reference Ed Code, I have 20 pages right here of Ed Code that we cannot violate, that we need to honor. The consultation is just going to be ongoing. It's teachers, it's principals, it's school personnel, it's meeting with uh, pupils in our local bargaining groups, and it's, that's going to be much more collaborative. Like Walter indicated, when we start to um, work together with all these different components, it's going to have to be something where it's going to be our new strategic plan that's going to be key. Next, when we look at our community outreach, um, we're going to have to go ahead and form that parent advisory committee, and it's going to have to be a good representation of people in our valley. We look at our English Learner Parent Advisory, our district um, English Learner Parent Advisory, our DLAC. That's going to be real important because as we look at our English learners, we want to make sure that we hear their voice. And again, you can see that the superintendent must respond in writing to all comments received. That's the chance you take when you go out because most people that have had an education, they feel like they're, they're pretty good experts and I think that's fine. At the same time, we need to educate our community and make sure we're doing that. Next, when you look at, uh, again, public inputs, again, um, we just have to get that information uh, as far as written comments, public hearing, and again, I must respond in writing to comments. Probably the easiest thing to do would be put Walter out in front. <laughs> because he thinks he's older than me, but he's really not. But he's our money guy. But I will honor Walter and keep Walter behind me. I'll be that Kevlar vest to do that. So I don't know how, um, if you compare Bear Valley with about 2,600 students, how are they doing this in LA Unified? How are they doing this in Oakland? How are they do, doing this in Adelanto? The challenges they're having in those community is when you're in a community that has, I'll call this a high-risk population, that haven't had a good time in school, they're not wanting to come back and have cookies and coffee and things like that to do this. That's the last place they want to go is to school. So it really, really makes it tough for them. And I'm just pleased in our valley, I think we're going to be in a pretty good, uh, pretty good position. As we add more complexity to this, we have to go ahead and follow something called a planning matrix that we have to include our um, strategic plan, we have to have our LCAP, we have to have our common core um, state standards, we have to have our English learners, we have to have our Title I for disadvantage, and then we need to show something for technology. You can see this is going to be a very involved process, and uh, I'm, I'm embracing this just like any challenge in my life, and I'm looking forward to it again as an opportunity, because again, we have a moral obligation to educate all of our youth here in the Valley. When we look at our um, stakeholder engagement goals, what we really need to do is really start to inform and consult, and I think this was a good night to talk to our, our city council. Um, we've got to get fact sheets, send out a newsletter and public comments, develop our focus groups and our workshops and do some action research. We're going to have something out at North Shore next Monday night at 6 o'clock for our community to listen to them. And then also we have some staff presentations coming up for uh, members of our staff here in our school district. When we start to look at adoption of the plan, um, we know, like I said, it has to be concurrent with our district budget. From that point, it goes to the county for approval. It's posted on our district website, and then they go ahead and post the LCAP. That's if it's done correctly. Now we start to look at oversight, and you can see there's layers after layers after layers. For whatever reason, if an LCAP is not approved, 
we start to, the accounting office starts to look at strengths and weaknesses. Uh, they can assign an academic expert. And the superintendent of public instruction, uh, they can assign the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence to provide advice and assistance. I would hope and bet that we don't have to go there, but I think, again, they've got layers and layers and layers uh, of things that might happen to a district. That's just a reality. Next, um, as we see here, you know, if a district fails to um, show the improvement of the outcomes in the subgroups when we look at uh, three out of four consecutive years, we know at that point that there's going to have to be some changes to the LCAP. Uh, there's some budget revisions. And then again, we start to look at um, uh, the governing board, uh, what action can be taken, and they can uh, actually appoint an academic trustee. I'm hoping that we don't have to go there, but again, if we look at Sacramento, this money that's coming out, they have to have, they have these mechanisms in place. Again, when we look at the, the question, what does it mean for Bear Valley, just like Walter said, um, when we look at the, the, it's really much work ahead. Uh, we know that we're going to receive some revenue, but when we start to look at accountability, that's going to take just a boatload of work right there. We've talked about the uncertainty, and we know that. We just There's many things beyond our control. When we look at the LCAP, uh, we know all the, the meeting with our teachers and pupils and administrative uh, school personnel and bargaining units. We know about the parent advisories. Uh, review and comment, uh, I need to respond in writing, and again, we've talked about public hearing, board adoption, county approval, so the spring will be busy for, uh, for myself and for Walter. When we summarize it, when we look at the LCAP, it's very complex. When we look at the eight years, a lot can happen. We have the volatility that's always going to be out there, the demographics. They're going to drive funding. If we look at another district like Walter said, there's many districts that aren't real happy about this because they're not getting anything in their supplemental and concentration. And uh, it's going to be real, real challenging for them to continue. With the LCAP, uh, we have the proportionality to make sure we truly are providing services for our disadvantaged youth. It's the outreach and building consensus. It's the, the non-negotiables, these are things that need to get done, and then the alignment of our budget priorities with their own cap goals. So again, we have the yin, we have the yang, we've got the LCFF, we've got the LCAP. Um, I believe based on the almost daily interaction we have online, the conferences, that we attend, we're students, Walter and I show up as students, and we're in the first row, and we're taking copious notes, but we feel good in our community that we've already got some good engagement with our community, and we're gonna get out in front of this just as soon as possible and get it done. So I'll entertain any questions. Okay, Councilman Young. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Madden, is there any, do you have any idea what it's gonna cost the district to implement these two programs? The cost. I think the cost is going to have to be just absorbed by our current uh, uh, budget right now. There's no additional funds to, to pull this off. We're going to have to do it internally. Because I, you know, just listening to both you and Mr. Khan talk, this is going to get pretty expensive before it's all over, I would, I would think. And this, this could be a full time job. Again, if I look at an LA Unified or a Long Beach one person, a superintendent or even a cabinet could not do this because if you look at the miles and miles and all the different ethnic groups, to pull that off in 60 days is almost impossible. So we're not going to wrestle with an 800-pound gorilla. We've got about a 50-pound gorilla. And I think well, we're going to do okay. We wish you Godspeed. <laughs> Thank you. Councilman Herrick. It, it uh, seems like it's uh, relatively, relatively uh, political how this all got put together, but with that said, um, and I listened very carefully, it's still as clear as mud. Um, I understand that uh, you guys are going to take this on, but to try to figure out how to sort all this out is going to be uh, probably not an easy thing to do. So how you explain that to the public is going to be very interesting, how you clearly explain it. So I, I, hopefully they're giving you lessons on that as well. No. There's no cookbook, there's no recipe book, there's no magic pill that you can take. 
It's simple. You go out and do that. I think, again, the advantage we have is I think we're pretty connected with our community. I will tell you, just on the Common Core alone, I didn't realize this. I thought the philosophy of getting students career and college ready was good. And there's already opposition, not just in Bear Valley, and I don't think we're at the level of some other areas in our uh, state. There's extreme opposition to the Common Core. There's petitions and things already going out to say they don't want their students to be taught that way. They don't want students to take the new online computer testing. They want to stay more traditional. I think when you look at your um, advocate groups, they're positioning themselves in board meetings to actually see what is included in the LCAP and based on what we have already heard, if those disadvantaged students are not being served, now we have a bigger issue. So you have to be, again, when you look at your portfolio, you have to show balance. For example, if a district made a decision to give employees a 15% raise with this money, which they could maybe justify that they want to retain highly qualified staff and they're not serving those students, that could be fatal for that, for that district and that community. So. And there, a lot of districts are getting a lot of pressure right now. We know that based on all the conversations that we engage in and things that we read online. So, yeah, we're going to have to be very meticulous. Um, I'm just going to take it one day at a time and continue to be receptive to feedback from our community. So is it this a good thing or a not so good thing? Well, I guess it depends how we look at it. I think the first year with anything, if you take a funny model that's been out there for 40 years, the first year and, and anything new is going to be difficult. I'm looking at it in three to five years. That's where it's really going to get interesting. I'm looking at 2016. You, you're very smart people. You pick up right away. What happens when the sales tax goes away? What's our plan? So it's us educating our collective bargaining groups and people to say that we're not out of the woods yet. So. What's nice working with Walter is he's very, very ultra conservative, and we might not be the most ambitious school district on spending all of our money, but I think we're going to have a really good plan that we're going to be able to stand on for years and years and years and years. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. Madden? Okay, well, I had a couple, but before I get into that, I just want to embarrass you a little bit. Uh, Mr. Madden, as, as some of you probably know, just got back from doing the Ultraman competition in Hawaii. And uh, I didn't know what an Ultraman was until I heard about him doing it. But it is more than twice as hard as an Ironman, which I had heard of. And uh, I had just blown away that you're capable of that. It's a, for, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a, the first day, it's a three-day deal. The first day you get in the water, you swim six miles. Then you get out and you ride a bike 90 miles with 6,000 vertical feet of climb. The second day, you get on a bike, you ride 170 miles with 4,000 vertical feet of climb. And the third day, you run a double marathon, 52 miles. And uh, Kurt, I know that you know that I did my first triathlon this year. The gulf between what you are capable of and what I am capable of is astonishing to me. And I know that you support our efforts to turn Big Bear into a mecca for all kinds of outdoor recreation. Uh, I just want you to know uh, what uh, an inspiration and role model you are to the people that live here and how grateful we are to have you as spokesman in that capacity. All right, enough of the ego stroking. Uh, oh, wait, you know, I lied, because uh, one of the things I was going to say is, is uh, I mean, I think most of the people here in the dais share my view that uh, we would hope that you're, you would be able to focus not just on the low-performing students, which is very important, and we support you in those efforts, but also on the high-functioning students, because by uh, tailoring education to the needs of the high-functioning students, we're creating an education system that is going to make people want to move to and live in Big Bear Lake, and that's very important to us. And so I want to commend you on your efforts uh, in, uh, just recently in implementing the STEM program at the middle school, as I think that is a great example of uh, creating a program that's going to meet the needs of those higher functioning kids and, and also in just the areas that they're going to need for job skills in the 21st century. So uh, I, I want, uh, want to let you know how much we appreciate that. Um, so you didn't talk about any financial uh, clubs ultimately uh, if we fail to meet these, uh, these accountability standards. Uh, at, at the end of the road, do they take money away if, if we don't meet it? They have complete control. They can just spend anything they choose to. Okay, so I mean, is well, there? I don't think they can take away funding, but they can definitely rearrange that LCAP plan and look at our budget and go through our budget 
to make sure wherever we're spending our money, that okay. we're going to make some very strong recommendations. I understand. So what I heard you say is it's separate. The funding formula is separate from the, L the uh, LCAP, but they reserve the right to step in and make decisions for the school board if, if we have not met those accountability standards. Yeah, and the way I view it is when you look at the submission, when you get the budget approved and the LCAP approved, they're not going to attack one. They're going to actually go into both because if we're not spending more, if we're not providing more services, they're going to have both right there and some adjustments will have to be made. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Madden, for, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just one other comment. I know we were talking a little bit about our gifted and talented education. And, and think of this, say this, this setting right here, if we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In our valley, if seven out of eight, or we would add two more, that would be a 10 for 100%, but seven out of 10 are disadvantaged. When we provide additional services or programs for students, if it's arts, if it's interventions, if it's enrichment, we can't just say, well, we're just going to serve these seven right here. It's really going to go for, for everyone. So I think that's what's going to be beneficial for our Gates students. At the same time, a sidebar, our board is approving to revitalize our Gate programs. And that's something we're working on right now for next year to really start that again. So we want to take care of those students too. All right. Well, thanks. And okay. thanks for coming out on a school board night and giving the excellent presentation. We have one more stop tonight, I think. Well, really, where is it? Are we going to the Democratic Club, Walter? Or I'm not, no, I'm not sure. But thank you again. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you too, Walter.